mix the hydrodynamics of integrable systems, and I know a lot of you, of course, are uh, experts in this area, but not all, and I wanted to uh, provide the, the, well, the, the general explanation for that. In, additional, uh, in addition, I will provide also some of new, the new results that we have, okay? So, um, yeah, so I mean, the, I think the, there's an experiment, I always start with this experiment, 2006, 2006 that uh, sparked a lot of activity in the context of non-equilibrium uh, integrable systems, so this quantum Newton cradle experiment. And it's an ex experiment where, I guess two tickets, yeah. Experiment where um, cold atoms trapped in, in, a, in a harmonic potential were made to move by using something called a Bragg pulse and uh, made to move into uh, two s as two separate clouds, and uh, there was kind of a lot of cold atoms, maybe like 200 or 300 or something like that. And it started moving w within that uh, harmonic uh, potential, x square, basically, and kind of uh, go going up and down and going through each other, these clouds of a lot of atoms going through each other and then up and down and through each other many times, a lot of time nonstop. And uh, it was kind of uh, surprising at that time. I mean, I mean, depending on your point of view, it can be completely unsurprising or very surprising. But in any case, they thought it was surprising because if you take some ordinary gas, you know, air or something, you know, blobs of gas and then kind of throw them at each other, they will extend the momentum and they will just thermalize and nothing will happen. Where here, these uh, cold atom gas, rubidium atom gases, they were thrown at each other and they didn't thermalize. They went through each other and continue kind of going around like that to so keep their momentum. So this lack of thermalization and this kind of, uh, yeah, so this, this uh, very special effect was seemed to be uh, uh, interesting and probably related to integrality that was the, the, uh, the idea that these people expressed. I mean, it was known at that time that these uh, cold atom gases were described by the Liebdenegger model. Now, there are different problems with this interpretation of integrability. One of them is that uh, this is a cold atom gas in a potential, so it's actually not integrable anymore because of the presence of the potential. And uh, the other thing is that uh, nobody had really studied uh, integrability properly in these inhomogeneous, non-stationary situations where things move and things are not homogeneous and all that, so it's a bit complicated. And but, but then people started studying the, the, well, the idea of thermalization and lack thereof in, in uh, uh, integrable systems, and then everything came out of that. So uh, generalized hydrodynamics is a theory that allows us to describe fully this experiment and you know, to understand what's happening there. Okay. So uh, let me start uh, kind of uh, with hydrodynamics, and I think this is very interesting, in fact, to describe correctly what we know or what is hydrodynamics, what are the structures, because there's a lot of very beautiful structures which can now then after that be adapted to integrability or to whatever other system you want, right? So the basic idea of hydrodynamics, what are different steps? The very first one is the, the one about uh, thermalization. So if you have a isolated, take it isolated, you know, it's just some, some quantum or classical system, very big, but isolated. And you start it in a state which is uh, not a steady state, uh, so not an eigenstate if it's, a, if it's quantum or not a stationary state in any case. And you time evolve it for a very, very long time and you look locally what happens. You know. So if you think about it physically, the particles will hit each other and do all kinds of things and it should somehow thermalize. Okay. So if you look at local observables, you evolve your, your state for a long time and look at the local observables, take the reduced density matrix. That should be, it should tend towards a very large time in a very, very large system, some reduced density matrix of a thermal state. Now, in general, what is the, the, the uh, concept behind that thermalization? What is the concept of maximization of entropy? Really, this is what's happening, okay? And maximization of entropy, well, this is uh, under certain constraint, the constraint provided by the dynamics, okay? So certainly, you time evolve, if you time evolve a conserved quantity, it will not change. So all the conserved quantities will not change with time. So certainly your final state will know about the initial conserved quantity. Okay? And so the idea is that you maximize entropy with respect to all available conservation laws uh, in the system, whatever the system is. So a quantum chain, a quantum field theory, a classical gas, there are conservation laws, there are conserved quantities. And what will happen towards the end, so this rule final should be something described by a density matrix with all the conservation laws available are present with appropriate Lagrange parameters that depend on the initial state. Okay. So that's the, the first thing. And this is something that has been observed in the context of integrable systems, where you have here an infinite number of conservation laws, and these are called the generalized Gibbs ensemble. And people have been studying that quite a lot. Okay. And so this is, uh, okay, now relatively well understood in integrable systems, but it's a general principle, right? So uh, entropy maximization. This is the first thing. The second thing to get hydrodynamics is that you apply this principle in a local fashion. In other words, you have your system which might be homogeneous, non-stationary, now this, 
you let it evolve in time, and then locally within fluid cells, which are big, you know, big so that they contain a lot of particles, but not too big so that they look small to you. Locally within this, things will have thermalize, so or, or maximize entropy. Eh? So that locally you will have all these Lagrange parameters associated to all these conservation laws. But the Lagrange parameters now will depend on where you look. So different fluid cells will have the thermalized or maximized entropy in different ways. And so this is, this, this is kind of the mesoscopic, there's a, there's a separation of scale between the macroscopic, mesoscopic, and microscopic. So, uh, you know, in your bath, this is macroscopic, a little drop of water, it looks, you know, very small, it looks pretty homogeneous and stationary, that would be the mesoscopic, and then if you look very, very, very small, you will start seeing the atom, uh, it's microscopic. Of course, there can be a lot of structures between these scales, but this is basically what's happening. And so, in mathematics, that means that if you have some initial state, whatever it is, in homogeneous and all that, you time evolve this whole thing and look at the local observable, it should be, after a large time or in appropriate conditions, it should be more or less well described by these states which have maximized entropy. So it should be well described by one of these density matrices, but which with the Lagrange parameters depending on space time. Okay. So this is an approximation, but this, this is the hydrodynamic approximation. It's important to notice this is a big reduction of the number of degrees of freedom. Okay. It's the, here, you can calculate any local observable. There's no reason why they should be related to each other in some way. Here, all your local observable are determined by few parameters, functions of space-time, but still a few parameters. So it's a big assumption, and uh, uh, so it's part of the assumption of hydrodynamics. Okay. Then what do you do with this? This is just a, an assumption that locally you get you maximize entropy. Uh, hydrodynamics is a dynamics where you can derive a dynamics from that, just from that assumption, basically. Okay. And the, the idea is to say, well, you, you we know microscopically that you have conservation laws, so these are the densities of the conserved quantities, and they have associated uh, uh, um, currents, like the neutral currents, right? And uh, the idea is that if you write these conservation laws, but take averages of that and use your hydrodynamic approximation, well, you get conservation laws for these averages, right? So these averages of densities and currents. And this is a dynamics. The, these the averages all depends on the Lagrange parameters. So this is the dynamics for the Lagrange parameters. And this is Euler hydrodynamics, right? So uh, whenever you have a system, whatever the conservation laws are, you, you calculate these averages with Lagrange parameters, you put that in, and this is your Euler hydrodynamics. Right? Now, uh, there's a matrix that you can construct, which was a quantity already introduced by Tomohiro Kisamoto this morning. Um, it is the following. So since there are as many Lagrange parameters are conserved densities, well, you can always fully characterize your state by the conserved densities. For instance, the particle density, the energy density, the momentum density. Uh, these are the standard things you would do in, in, uh, in uh, hydrodynamics. Yeah, so it's fully characterized by that. As a consequence, the currents associated with these densities depend on these cues. They depend on them in, in a some particular fashion that depends on what these averages are. So this is a characteristic of your system, the question of state how the currents depends on the density. For instance, how the pressure, which is the current of momentum, depends on the energy and the number of particles. Like this. And once you have these functions, then you can rewrite this equation, early equation, in a quasi-linear form, which is that form that just involves the conserved densities. Right? And this quasi-linear form involves a certain matrix, which is this, this uh, Jacobian, it's called a flux Jacobian, very often, which tells you how to transform from the currents to the densities, essentially. And that's a characteristic of the system. This is a, like one of the most important objects in the hydrodynamics. It's an object that Tomohiro was talking about in the context of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics. Okay. So this is, uh, these are the hydrodynamic equations. And then it's just a matter of starting with some appropriate initial condition and evolving that and then seeing what happens. Right? Now, uh, this was the Euler scale, which was uh, the, the largest scale possible to the approximation that I've written there. This approximation is just valid when things, well, it's expected to be valid when things are very, very smooth in space time. Things don't change a lot in space, neither in time, and that should be valid. But if you start with some initial state which is not that smooth, then that is approximation is just incorrect. Okay, so you have to modify it. And how do you modify it? Well, there's one approximation or one assumption you can make, which is the basic assumption of hydrodynamics, and is the fact, is the assumption that uh, the average densities, all these Qs, i of x, and on a given time slice, fully determine the state. In other words, if you know all these average densities at a given time, then you will know all these average densities at a later time, that they fully determine the state. In other words, also, any conserve, any uh, average of, of some op operator here will just depend on all these average densities at that time, 
in some way. So these divergencies should form a, a good dynamical variable. That might be true or not, but this is the, the assumption of hydrodynamics. As a consequence, you can write currents in hydrodynamics as not just function of average densities, but as correction to this function of average density. So the current at space time point xt is a function of the average density at space time point xt plus a correction to that, which might depend on what's happening around the space time point xt, say, with a derivative of this average density. This is a derivative expansion, and you can add as many terms as you want. So the current, you just you don't write it anymore, just as you know, using this, I come back, using this approximation that this is locally thermalized. Now, you don't, don't write it like that. What you write is that it is locally thermalized plus corrections, and the corrections are terms that involve derivatives of the average densities or derivative of the Lagrange parameters equivalent, or well, you know, you know, some some characteristic of the state. And so now. These derivatives have uh, coefficients, and these coefficients are, harder, are hard to calculate. And the way they depend on these cues, uh, this is called the um, constitutive relation. It's part of the so-called constitutive relation of hydrodynamics. Okay? And the question is, what are these coefficients? How to calculate them? Or can we add more derivatives? Can, you know, can we expand the hydrodynamics to higher orders? And uh, so these are interesting questions, and these are the, some of the important objects one must calculate when one does hydrodynamics. Yes. Ah, no, no, there's no guarantee at all of convergence. In fact, in general, it's not convergent, not expected to be convergent. There's no guarantee at all that the second derivative has, is it has any meaning at all. So it's, this is really to be understood as an asymptotic expansion. And it's not clear that, you know, that uh, this has to hold, that, hold that at all orders, in fact. It's completely not obvious. And in fact, th there is this assumption that you can just describe everything in terms of these conserved densities at a given time slice. It's a very strong assumption. And even if you have this, even if the full series, you know, somehow it would be convergent in some way, still you have that assumption, and it's not clear that, you know, that is not expected to hold at all scale. So this is really a large scale, large time limit, and the validity of it is to be uh, assessed properly. That's my understanding. Other question. So, but but in principle, you know, you, so you can you can expect to that. In fact, even the validity of this first term is is to be understood properly. I, I'll just uh, discuss it just now. Okay. So if you put that in this conservation equation, you get essentially an navier stokes type of term with a second derivative of the conserved density. Okay. Now, so this is for, for evolution of conserved densities, right, of, of conserved densities, or, uh, of, uh, available conserved densities. There's one uh, comment that I wanted to make when you go to diffusive and higher order, is that the conserved densities, they are defined as the densities for these conserved charges, right? But wait a minute, the density of a conserved charge, total conserved charge, is not unique. You can add a total derivative with something that factorizes at large distances, and it's still a good density of conserved charge, right? Your energy density, you can have a total, you can add a total derivative. And so there's an ambiguity, there's a gauge ambiguity, and this ambiguity does not affect the A matrix, does not affect the earlier scale, but affects diffusive scale. So when you say that you have a diffusion operator like that, you've got to specify your gauge choice. You cannot say, oh, this is my diffusion operator. You have to say, what are your conserved densities more precisely? Specify a gauge choice. And that's, uh, you know, it's, you have to specify it in various ways. You can specify it using symmetries and all kind of things. And, um, uh, but it's just kind of a common, so one has to be careful at diffusive scale. Okay? But it's just a gauge invariance. It doesn't have a physical, uh, like, if you, once you make a gauge choice, then it, it's, you get something. If you make a different gauge choice, you can map it to the other gauge choice. Okay. So, <coughs> so this is hydrodynamics, but with, with hydrodynamics, I can actually, you can go much further. Okay? And where you can go, where you can actually calculate uh, correlation functions. So I was talking to you now about averages of observables. Well, if you do, you can think of it as doing uh, um, linear response. You have your average of an observable, but you then you change a bit your initial condition. Just change it a little bit, right? If you change it a little bit, it kind of corresponds to, uh, in a linear response to inserting something at time zero. You can put it at space zero. Okay. So correlation functions also satisfy these equations. And uh, so that means with hydrodynamics, you can go further than just describing averages. You can describe correlation functions. In fact, you can also describe higher, higher point correlation functions. And within this picture, it's relatively uh, clear what the meanings of these A's and B's are. Uh, basically, you, what you can do, you can try to change your variable to diagonalize this A matrix. And it's something also that Tomo talked about. And the eigenvalues are what I call the effective velocities. They're velocities of the normal modes. And the meaning is that if you solve this equation and see what it gives, it gives you that the correlation function is basically essentially zero everywhere 
except along the space-time point, space-time uh, line corresponding to these velocities. So the eigenvalues of this flux Jacobians are the velocities that carry strong correlations. And this is something that you can see from the correlation function. So the correlation function will have, uh, if, you know, if it's controlled by this equation, will have a shape of something that is very small away from uh, x equals vt for these various v's. And around these x equals vt's, it will have some you know, square root of t uh, spreading and some shape that depends on the specific values of these d's and a's. Okay. And so that corresponds to, this is the, the intuition of a ballistic, uh, ballistic transport, of course, of quantities. Ballistic transport is the thing that produces correlation between local average. And if you think about it, like if you're in the water and then you put your finger there and then that wave that comes out, then your other finger will feel the waves eventually, you know, depending on the velocity of these, of these little ripple coming out. And when it feels the wave, this is a correlation due to basic transport. And it's a strong correlation. Like the wave is pretty strong. When you hit the water, there's also a little bit of correlation, you know, exponentially suppressed one that you might feel, you know, quicker, but they're so small that you, you know, almost don't feel them. The, the bigger one that you will feel are the ones from basic transport. So, so uh, these are the velocities at which you, s you see something. Okay. Um, yes. So uh, part of the approximation, so this is to be understood appropriate way in, in, uh, as a derivative expansion. So this differential equation might have higher derivatives and all that. And uh, what it tells you, so the first derivative tells you where you're going to have strong correlation. The second derivative, it tells you how big that region is going to be, a strong, a strong correlation. And if it's second derivative, you would expect it's a square root of t uh, region. Uh, okay. And the uh, higher derivative will tell you more about this, you know, this little region where you have correlation. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I'll come to, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, because you know too much. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yes, the, so, you know, this, this is a little picture, and you solve that now, this. In fact, when you calculate correlations from correlation functions, there are kind of effects that come into play. And this is uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, you know, if you actually look at this function as a function of x and t, well, yeah, there can be all kind of other oscillations, a lot of effects that come into play. And uh, the proper meaning of this little picture and that equation is if you go to Fourier space, that's my understanding of it. If you go to Fourier space, so do an appropriate averaging over space, with the k there, so a momentum, and take k very small. So in that limit of k very small and t very large, then you should observe something like that. This is just a solution to that equation. Okay? So you should observe either the i a k t, k t with this matrix and d k squared t with that diffusion matrix. Now, uh, this is what you should observe, but that washes out all these oscillations and all these special features that you might find at higher frequencies in space and time. It washes them out. And that's the meaning of uh, earlier of a uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, regime, that's my understanding. And to get these other structures, you won't you won't get them from small k expansion. So this is really understood as small k small k, k expansion. Okay. So it it gives you something about correlation functions, but not everything. Yes. So but but uh, so this is what is expected to occur. And uh, here you have the A matrix, the diffusion operator, and if you solve the, you know the equation for the for it so there's a C matrix, which is a static correlation matrix that appears, which is just this integration over X of a correlation function of functional densities, so, which is something that's purely thermodynamics. You just obtain that by differentiating with respect to beta, the average functional density. Okay. So thi this is, uh, yes, this, this is, but well, you know, this is already linearized, you know, because we, we uh, assume a small uh, change of the initial condition and everything else homogeneous stationary. And then that is all at linear order, indeed. Yes, it's linear hydrodynamics. Yeah. Now, uh, there was something about nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics that Tomoero talked told us about, and he said, well, you know, often by by various uh, ways we can see that the spreading is not t, is not square root of t, but it's bigger, like t to the two thirds, kpz or something like that. In fact, there are all kind of exponents that you can find, not just kpz. And so that means that what I told you just now about the diffusive operator just fails, is incorrect. And what is the correct theory, I don't quite know, and I, I haven't seen it. Certainly, there is one way with, uh, by uh, um, 
uh, hand wavy way where you, you can put a diffusion temple at the noise and then look at nonlinear orders and then you get something. But if you do what, what, I, what I express here, this with the diffusion operator is not that. This is really the macroscopic diffusion operator. I don't add the noise. If I added the noise to get the right operator, I'd have to integrate out the noise and see that I just get this right diffusion operator. And in general, when you add the noise, well, you don't get this, this kind of uh, diffusion equation to circuit order. You just don't get that. You get KPZ universality task. task okay? So this diffusion structure is generically in one dimensional fluids incorrect. Right? This is what we see in KPZ. It's very interesting because when you do this nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, there's a particular coupling matrix called G that Tomohiro introduced. And that G matrix is related to the A matrix that I described. It's a derivative of the A matrix, actually. Second derivative. Yeah, uh, first derivative of A matrix. And uh, if that G coupling has some zeros and diagonals, then we're back to diffusive. So then there's no problem. And, so, and, then, and then the diffusive, there's an uh, operator D that appears. And so it looks like there's a relation between this A matrix, or its derivative, and the diffusion operator. In particular, if the A matrix has a certain structure, then you have a diffusion operator. If it doesn't, then by this general theory of nonlinear fluctuation in hydro, that diffusion operator should diverge. So this uh, seems to be a relation between earlier scale and diffusive scale uh, that is seen via this, this uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics, with, which is, I don't think is fully understood. Yes, exactly. So I just said. So D, indeed, so D diverges uh, when you have this super. So, so not only so when I say everything fails, uh, you know, you try to calculate this D in a macroscopic fashion. Uh, so there are different ways of calculating that. Kubo formula and all this, or, or ex like like the way I've defined that, and you find divergence. So you expect this diverges. Uh, uh, so kind of generically, I mean, if if you have KPZ scaling, okay, so. It looks like, you know, for, for ordinary fluid, this diffusion uh, d description is not quite fine. But in integrable system, as it turns out, Jacopo will talk about that, I think, I believe. You would it is correct. So that, that description is correct in integrable systems for, for certain reasons. So somehow you don't have this KPZ scaling, this non-air fluctuating hydrodynamics does not destroy uh, the nice diffusive aspect and all that for, mo for most objects in, uh, in an integrable system, not for all. And so, so it is still a, a, a useful description. Okay, um, then uh, you can go further, and then to go further, let me go back to earlier scales. Um, so I, I told you about correlation functions of conserved densities. You actually can actually calculate correlation functions of any other operators, O, O prime, local observables, by uh, earlier hydrodynamics. So there's a formula for, I mean, this is now completely at earlier scale. I'm forgetting completely about diffusion. So that, so that should be fine even if it's skip easy. It's at earlier scale, is the same thing. Okay? So the formula is that when you take this correlation function, xt and Fourier transform, take k very small and t very large, that's hydrodynamic limit, so long wavelength, small time. kt fixed, what you should get, what one expects, there's no proof of that, general proof, what you should get is a formula like this. What that implies the exponential of this akt, the C inverse matrix, and some coupling of these local operators to the conserved quantity. So how they change with respect to change of betas. Okay? So the picture is that you have this local operator and then it propagates something that basically is the conserved quantity and then that affects the local operator there. So this is a, a so-called hydrodynamic projection formula, very powerful, and tells you about large space-time uh, structure of arbitrary correlation functions. Right. Questions about this? So another thing that you can uh, calculate from this is the very famous uh, Drude weight. In fact, the, uh, there are other ways of calculating it. But from this uh, hydrodynamic projection, you can calculate this large time limit of current-current correlator. And you get a form of the Drude weight just in expressed in terms of flux Jacobian and the static correlation matrix. And uh, Drude weight is some fundamental characteristic for ballistic transport. So, so if you know these matrices, you know Drude weight already. It's a quite important object. And finally, uh, yeah, finally, for the general hydrodynamic uh, uh, perspective, there's something else that you can get at earlier hydrodynamics using the flux Jacobian. Uh, again, it's at earlier scale without diffusion. Diffusive effects would give correction to that. And it's uh, this uh, full counting statistics or large deviation function or scale cumulant generating function, all these names. It's something that a uh, previous speaker talked about in the concept of, uh, of a stochastic model. right? So you look at uh, some states, you have your, your hydrodynamic state, it can be 
at out of equilibrium, it can transport current and all that. And you can't say the number of particles that cross a certain interface, or maybe the quantity of energy or, or some other charge. Okay? So you count this as a time integrated uh, current at a given point. Okay? And that uh, is a random variable. Random maybe because you, you have a quantum state, so it's fluctuating, or it maybe it's a classical state, but the initial condition is thermal, so there's an ensemble description is fluctuating. So this is a random variable. Okay? And uh, what you'd like to calculate are well, different things, but one of them is the cumulants of this random variable. So the log of the average of the exponential with a, a, a generating parameter lambda. So the cumulants, they just uh, end power of this random variable, you know, cumulant connected correlation function. And the cumulants, you, you know, depending on the situation, but if you, if you have a large division principle, like the thing that was explained in the previous talk, then you would expect them to, to scale like time. The average, of course, will stay scale like time, because the average is just integration over time of the current, and then it's the current value is the same. This is a stationary state. Okay. But uh, the second cumulant also will scale like time. The third cumulant for now expected to scale like time. So uh, and these cumulants, they are, they are essentially time, uh, kind of time difference correlation functions of current. Okay. Well, it turns out there is a, a general formula, or at least a, a process, to calculate these cumulants in our generality. Uh, of hydrodynamics. So if you know the A matrix, what you can do is simply uh, construct a flow on your space of Lagrange parameters, parameterized by lambda. Lambda is this generating parameter for the cumulant. Okay? And the flow is defined by a simple equation. It's just the lambda derivative of these Lagrange parameter is equal to minus the sign of the A matrix, the flux Jacobian, the thing that tells you how things propagate, where things propagate. Okay? And the sign of this A matrix is just taking the sign of its eigenvalues and then you know, on diagonalizing. And this f of lambda, the generating function for our cumulants, is just obtained by integrating the average current in that lambda-dependent state, the state that is fol follows a certain flow. So that means that the cumulants, they can all be calculated using the A and the C matrix and all that. Okay? The first cumulant is just the current. The second, cum second cumulant result has this form, absolute value of this A matrix times C. Third cumulant is a bit more complicated, etc. So this is an uh, object that you can get exactly if you know the A and C matrix just from earlier hydrodynamics. Okay? Uh, um, so one thing uh, interesting, so if A is independent of the state, then this is very simple to solve. And in that case, one should understand the hydrodynamics as being the one of a free model. So when the flux Jac Jacobian does not depend on the state, this is the case of free particles. If it depends on the state, then there's interaction, non-trivial interaction. And the other thing is that if there is a velocity which is equal to zero, then the correlation, uh, current current correlation on one uh, point will be rather large because of this propagating mode. And then you might have diverging cumulants. And it's, you expect to have cumulants that diverge, higher order cumulants that diverge. And that is uh, s something that is related to what a previous speaker uh, uh, called the dynam dynamical phase transitions. It's phase transition in a non, non equilibrium uh, transport. Uh, uh, kind of free energy, like this f of lambda. Okay. So, uh, so these are certain things that you can access using Euler hydrodynamics. Now, notice that this is not uh, so. Uh, uh, th these uh, uh, cumulant uh, generating functions are often calculated using macroscopic fluctuation theory, where you have a hydrodynamic description with diffusion. Here, this is the equivalent of that with with ballistic transport, pure ballistic transport, where you can calculate cumulants using the ballistic quantities, so the earlier scale quantities, A and C matrix. Okay. Questions about this? So, yes. Um, in the case of what, sorry? So, yeah, so, I mean, the, the A matrix by itself it, it has real eigenvalues, one can show, because this C matrix is positive, and A C matrix is something that's symmetric, and then you can change your, your uh, inner product, uh, natural inner product, and make it so it has you like values. Diffusion will give correction, so there's a diffusion operator now will give corrections, and uh, I mean uh, you, I you know the A matrix has this eigenvalue like independently. The diffusion will give correction to whatever quantities you want to calculate with the A matrix. For instance, here there will be diffusive corrections, and I don't know if they can be interpreted as as effective velocity gaining imaginary part. That much I don't know possibly, but. Uh, Certainly, the A matrix itself, uh, you know, by construction, has real eigenvalue. So A is not symmetric, but A times C is a symmetric matrix, and C is a positive matrix. So you can use C to define a new inner product, uh, and then then is uh, uh, kind of a new uh, positive form. 
and then you see that uh, uh, A times C will, will have real eigenvalues and as a consequence A as well. So, the you so, so yeah, so the there's a structure that allows you to show real eigenvalues. Other questions? Okay, so uh, so this is general structure, and then the point here is, can we do all that in integrable systems? So I, I know I spent half an hour on that, but this is quite important. So can we, if we have infinitely many constant charges and we, we know integrable, can we calculate the average densities, currents, symmetrics, a matrix diffusion, and all that? I'm not going to talk about diffusion. This is Jacopo's talk about that, but let me see how much how far I can go describing these things. Okay, and if we have this, then we have all these results, right? Correlation functions, uh, cumulants, uh, and you know uh, all this kind of thing. So, um, so there are, there are different ways of, uh, of, of uh, um, constructing. Uh, well, first thing I want to say, if you, if you calculate the Qs and the Js, so the average density and currents, already you have the Cs and the As. You don't have diffusion, but you have C and As. And so this is sufficient basically to get everything else. So what you want to calculate are these average densities and currents. Okay. Now, uh, there is a very uh, powerful formalism in quantum integrable system, which is the beta and the thermodynamic beta and SAS, which uh, all of you know uh, relatively well. And so basically, you have uh, roots, beta roots. So I'm going to take really the simplest discussion possible. Beta roots, conserved charges act on these beta roots in a simple fashion by sum of one particle eigenvalues. And average of local operators are essentially, by equivalence of ensemble, uh, calculated by average of typical states where you have a density of beta roots. Uh, described by this rho p, uh, I should not have put xt here, rho p of theta, theta being this quasi-momentum for the beta roots. Okay. And so you can calculate, you can forget about the beta i's in the trace of exponential minus beta i and all that. Just take one beta, beta, beta state with a large number of beta roots that are all very condensed forming a density, and that's your GGEs. Okay. So that's, that was uh, one of the main discoveries of uh, GGEs that you can just use TBA and uh, use the density of beta roots to get GGEs. Okay. And so now what we want to do is this have this uh, rho p. Now this rho p, this uh, beta root, can be related to the, uh, the Lagrange parameters by, again, by the beta ansatz. So the here, here is the fermionic beta ansatz. We have a log 1 plus exponential minus epsilon, which is a fermionic uh, type of uh, free energy. And it's just obtained by a certain derivative of something, an integration of this log of 1 plus exponential minus epsilon, where epsilon is the pseudo-energy, which involves the, uh, uh, which, uh, which will involve the Lagrange parameters, which solves a nonlinear integral equation. This is from beta and SAS and from analysis of uh, finite uh, root densities. And then in the end, once you have this rho p, the average densities are just integration over this rho p of the one particle eigenvalue. So the average densities are simple to calculate. Okay? So this is known for quite some time. Now, what you want is the, are the average currents, and uh, the average currents are more complicated to calculate. And this is still actually subject of current research, how to calculate average currents in the GGE in an integrable system. Okay. Well, we know how to calculate, but how to prove that? We, we cannot know because we can we kind of guess it or, or calculate it in different ways, but how to prove that? But the result that we want to prove has a very simple expression. The average currents are just expressed as integration over root densities, beta root densities, of uh, uh, one particle eigenvalue times some kind of velocity, which I call V effective again there, like my V effective that I had previously in this uh, general hydro. It's the end is the same V effective. Okay. And the V effective is it's a modification of the groove velocity. The groove velocity is derivative of the energy over momentum, so that has to do with the dispersion relation. It's a modification that involves the differential scattering phase, which is uh, the thing that is involved in the beta and that's wave function, so derivative with respect to so the momentum of that phase in, in the beta and that's wave function. And uh, difference of velocity. So if you uh, calculate, solve this linear integral equation, plug it into here, then you get the average current in the GGE. Okay? So this is an equation of state. So this is kind of the, the, the main thing. Okay? Now how do you show that? Well, uh, originally in we showed it in relativistic quantum field theory using crossing symmetry. It's a very, very simple argument that says that if you calculate an average current, in some state, well, this is the same thing as an average density in a state where you have exchange x and t. Well, that what you want to exchange is x in imaginary time. Okay? And uh, this exchange of x and t in terms of rapidities is just i pi over 2 minus theta. And so you have an exact equality between these two things, and the average densities you know how to calculate. That, so that, that gives you this equation after some massage of equations, okay? of this uh, integral equation. So you have a current, but uh, this was in relativistic QFT. This was an argument using crossing. It was 
shown actually more uh, correctly by um, uh, Wu and Yoshimura uh, recently by a form factor expansion in relativistic quantum field theory was numerically verified in many ways, in fact, in XXZ chain in particular, and the proof in XXZ chain is coming, I'm told. Uh, Bash plus guy is uh, confirming it. Okay, so this is the currents, and um, once you have the currents, well, then you have everything, right? You just have to write your densities and your currents and your conservation equation, and you just cancel out these function of theta, these one particle eigenvalues, assuming they're quite complete, and you get the early equations for your integrable system, right? Um, so these are the basic equation for uh, generalized hydrodynamics. And from that, in principle, we should be able to get everything. Now, you can make a transformation of variable, which is very useful by constructing the occupation function, the density of particle to state density. Rho s is the beta and that state density which satisfies a certain integral equation. And when you do that, you find, indeed, the quasi-linear form of the, of the early equations that I talked about at the beginning where you have the A matrix there. So you have DTN, DXN, you have the A matrix there. Okay? And not only that, but A matrix is already diagonalized in this form because you have the thetas there that characterize your various modes and uh, you just have, uh, you don't have a, a kernel with the various theta, you just have a single theta there. So this is the diagonal form of the quasi-linear uh, form of the early equation. Okay? So that means that these effective velocity, which appeared in a formal way from beta and that, are nothing else but the eigenvalues of the flux Jacobian in the case of uh, generalized hydrodynamics. Okay? And here the thetas, which are the rapidity of uh, beta roots, they are the ij's, the index, the indices I had for my hydrodynamics. Okay. okay. Um, now, you, this, so this is the, the beta and zas derivation of this equation. There's also a classical derivation of this equation. So one thing about generalized hydrodynamics is that it doesn't, it doesn't care if it's quantum or classical. It's valid in a large number of systems. And uh, one uh, kind of a hint at that is that if you look at this equation, it has a very simple and nice interpretation in terms of soliton scattering. Okay. In fact, this equation appeared in, in the context of soliton scattering uh, much before you know, we all did this work on generalized hydrodynamics. And the idea is simply that if you look at, uh, so if these little balls represent solitons and you look at what happens when they go around and scatter, well, they accumulate time delays at this as they scatter as solitons. And these accumulated time delays in a gas of a lot of particles change their velocity overall, right? And the way it changes the velocity is simply by, uh, well, you can calculate it by uh, counting the number of time delays accumulated, which is integrating overall the possible rapidities, the density of particles that rapidities and the time delay occurred, uh, or the, here the space delay corresponding to this time delay occurred, uh, that occurred in the scattering. So this differential scattering phase now can be interpreted as this, this uh, s uh, time delay or space uh, shift from scattering, and the rest is just from probability of meeting other particles at other rapidities. Right? So this formula is simply obtained from a uh, soliton time delay picture, uh, but this is a classical picture. Yeah, this formula was a quantum uh, picture. So, but somehow it's the same formula that, that seemed to occur with classical quantum. Perhaps we can understand these solitons as wa quantum wave packets that form the state in the, in the, in the quantum picture, but it's not completely uh, clear. Okay. Any questions about this? So there's another way, actually, of uh, deriving the GHG equations. Uh, so, so the way that I've derived till now is following the basic principle of hydrodynamics where you have densities, currents, equation of states, and then construct the flux Jacobian and all do all these things, okay? Uh, uh, good question? Yes? 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 <coughs> so, um, I don't know if I can uh, take away this assumption uh, it is true that there was uh, um, an assumption uh, to simplify the derivation that, uh, so I, I don't know, I haven't analyzed that. Uh, it seems that the equation is valid in quite some generality, but uh, indeed one has to be a bit uh, careful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know, uh, yes, I don't know if this assumption can be taken away. Other questions from the other? Yeah. Yeah, so indeed, uh, it seems paper, the derivation is rather different. Uh, it's not from the scattering picture. 
But there's another way, in fact, uh, without having to calculate uh, you know, that uh, self consistent equation, in fact. And another way of deriving this GHG equation without even having to assume the usual uh, local entropy maximization of, of your gas and then take this local entropy maximized state and look at this thermodynamics and all that. In fact, one thing that one should see in the, in the, in the beta and Z derivation, the local entropy maximized state, you would describe it using TBA. But as we know, TBA is derived by taking finite volume, assuming periodic boundary conditions, and doing that kind of thing. Okay? Why, in, of course, in the gas, you don't have a, a periodic boundary condition. But there's a way, in fact, using a scattering state of understanding this equation, which does not involve a priori thinking about uh, entropy maximizing uh, some local to itself. And the idea is as follows. It can be th thought about in the, um, uh, in the case of classical gases. Okay? So you can, you can do in other, uh, uh, other setups, but classical gases is the simplest. So think you, think you have some bunch of particles with interaction on some large volume. It can be large but finite, okay? and then it can be homogeneous, right? It can have, you know, it has fluids and all that, but large volume but finite. Now think about this bunch of particles with position and velocities, and then expand them out very, you know, far, uh, you know, in the future, or, or maybe, you know, go go back from the past. Somehow I like to think from the past, okay? Or go to the future. It doesn't matter, okay? So expand them out, and then they will, uh, if if interaction is repulsive, they will all go their own directions and be very far from each other and go as free particles. This is a scattering state. Yeah? And these three particles, they are described by momenta, so the in momenta, and, and um, uh, um, uh, so uh, impact parameters, which are basically the shift of this trajectory with respect to the nominal trajectory that would go, say, to the center of the gas. Right? So these are characteristics of this asymptotic uh, description. Right? And it turns out, uh, classical mechanics is not so, so hard to understand that, uh, these x in p n they also form a canonical system of coordinates classically, and not only that the Hamiltonian so so this is can be seen as a change of coordinate for the gas, okay. and the Hamiltonian is expressed in a trivial way from that in this asymptotic coordinate. So these are the coordinates that, that trivialize or diagonalize the Hamiltonian the asymptotic coordinates. Okay. It's just p square over two in the case of Galilean particles. Okay. And more than that, since now this uh, Hamilton is trivial, in this asymptotic coordinate, what you have is a free gas, a gas of free particles with their momenta and positions. And we know what to how to describe the hydrodynamic of a free gas because it's just the Liouville equation. The densities is just densities in phase space, and we know how to evolve that. It's dt rho plus p dx rho equals zero. Okay. So this is a description of you. So, so once you have your asymptotic state, if you write this equation, that will be the correct description of you know, of your, of your density of particles. You just, all you have to do now is to solve that and map back to the original variable. Of course, this mapping back, the scattering map, is very complicated in general. Okay? But in integrable system, it's rather simple. Because in integrable systems, if you have factorized scattering, then when two particles scatter, well, there's a shift, you know, some, some shift due to the interaction. But the momenta are preserved, and all the momenta are always preserved. So you can think about following one particular momentum. This is a, a quasi-particle. You follow the velocity. Velocity tracer, okay? And if you look in the in state, you have all these velocities, so, and, y and you see what happens when you change x in, in your asymptotic state. Well, as you map it back, what you're going to do is you're going to meet, uh, you know, more or less uh, uh, other particles and accumulate, accumulate shifts like that. So essentially, this is a change of uh, notion of distance in space. So x uh, has certain distance, x in is a certain distance, but x is a different distance because of the because of the accumulated shift. And so you can write the dx in is related to dx uh, by this change of uh, metric, and the change of metric is just obtained by summing over all the particles. You know the shift incurred by uh, every particle that you've that you've uh, met. If you do this change of metric on the trivial equation, you get the non-trivial equation. That's something that we've that we had shown actually some time ago without having this scattering picture completely. Right? And so this equation actually just just uh, come come out from the equation for from the Liouville equation of free particles in the asymptotic uh, coordinates. So here you don't need to make local uh, fluid cells approximation and all that. It comes out for the change of metric. It's particular to integrable systems, of course, because non-integrable systems. The map from x into x is really, really complicated, and you don't have this nice linear structure. So, there's integrability playing an important role here. Any questions? So, uh, <laughs> what I wanted to get so, this is uh, the GHG equation. Uh, uh, so, okay, I'll kind of uh, wrap up. Um, well, 
soon. So basically, the GV structure is rather general. There's a differential scattering phase that determine, determine the model energy, momentum, and all these uh, one particle eigenvalue. And there's a function, the, this uh, log of one plus exponential mass epsilon. You can put any other function there that characterizes the statistics of the particle. And once you have that, then you have a whole formalism that allows you to calculate equation of state and a lot of things. Okay? And so let me now show some of the, I wanted to say that you can also add um, uh, force term, uh, but that's a bit more complicated uh, in general, but uh, it's, it's possible to add a force term. So you can calculate all these objects that are introduced now using these exact formulas. So the C matrix, okay, so what you have to do, you have to differentiate with respect to beta, these average, you have to do all kind of TBA uh, manipulation. C matrix, you obtain exact uh, result which is expressed as an integration of theta, particle density, some function that knows about the type of particles, and then a product of the dress one particle eigenvalues of the conserved quantities that you're interested in. And these dress one particle eigenvalues are things that satisfy some linear integral equation. Okay? But not only the C matrix, the A matrix as we can calculate, and it's simply expressed, it's more simply expressed uh, in terms of A times C, you can calculate. And it's the same form, but it's the effective velocity that occurs. And uh, the Drude weight you can calculate, which was ACA transpose, also exactly, is the same form with the square of the ve effective velocity that occurs here. And so these are exact results for non-trivial uh, hydrodynamic matrices in general integrable systems. This is really like any integrable system, uh, Drude weight and all that. And uh, this dress operation is actually the natural operation that diagonalizes the flux Jacobian. So you see explicitly that effective velocity are indeed the diagonalities of flux Jacobian. Okay. So you have these matrices, and in particular, that means that you have also uh, correlation functions of arbitrary operators. You can also write it. Uh, so this results is uh, a hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic limit, small k large t of arbitrary operator can be written also in terms of TBA quantities. The only thing that you need to know are the average of these operator in GGEs because you need to take derivative respect to beta, and, and these average give rise to certain functions which you can put in here, and then you have exact expression. Okay. And one thing interesting is that in the typical fluids, you have a finite number of uh, effective velocities. And then if you look at correlation functions away from these effective velocities, you find typically exponential decay, exponential uh, decay of correlation function. At the velocity, you find algebraic decay, so a much more uh, stronger correlation. In integrable system, you find one over t decay of correlation function generically, because basically you have a continuum of these, uh, of these velocities. And so uh, the, the decay of correlation function is rather different, and it, it can be inferred from that. Okay. And uh, you can also express then the, the full counting statistics for, for transports. You look at the total no quantity of energy or particle or whatever that has gone through a point in time t, and uh, take the cumulance of that divided by t, full counting statistics. There are exact expressions for that as well. Uh, the, so there was a flow equation that I had written. It can be written in terms of the uh, pseudo energy. And then the full quantum statistic itself satisfies certain equation. It is some more complicated equation, but you can write explicitly the second cumulant, the third cumulant, uh, and the other cumulants get more complicated. They involve all kind of functions, so I mean you have to do lots of TBA works. But you have exact results for these for these things, C two, C three, and all that. Okay? And it is interesting that in uh, in this integrable system case, there is no divergency of this full quantum statistic. There is no dynamical phase transition generically. The, the cumulants all seem to be finite, take fine values, and uh, so it's still under investigation exactly why this is so, but it appears to be the case. Okay. Questions about this? So, so from this, you have the, uh, these exact results. So I wanted to, okay, how much do I have? I have how much? 30, 30 seconds before the 10 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> 30 seconds was short, okay. So I wanted to say maybe uh, one thing which is uh, very interesting, I, I could have spent much more time on that, but um, so, so there was, so we are part of this collaboration, but really the experimentalists are Max Schemmer, Isabelle Bouchoul, and Jérôme Dubai was the leader of this project, where the experiment was done to check hydrodynamic equation explicitly, and so, yeah, now it's now. <laughs> so let me, maybe like two minutes, okay. So, so we, uh, so this was a cold atom gas again. So rubidium atoms trapped by a magnetic field, and we tried the ver various situations, put an initial potential, and then change the potential, and see how the cold atom gas evolve, and just compare the result of uh, density of atoms per unit uh, position uh, at various times. Compare that with 
uh, numerically integrating the Euler GHD equation for the Liev Denegger model. So just direct comparison, right? And um, so we find rather good agreement. So this is the case of uh, starting with a double well potential and just taking away the potential altogether and seeing how the particles just expand in, in, uh, in space. And uh, they expand in a particular fashion. So the Wigley curve here is the experiment and uh, it's overlapped uh, with uh, the theory and it, uh, it works extremely well. Okay. And the dotted curve is uh, just to show that our theory works and that other theories don't work. Uh, so the dotted curve is just a standard hydrodynamics, three component standard uh, hydrodynamics, which you can do for Liebdenegger as well. And that clearly does not work. In fact, standard hydrodynamics in this setup will predict eventually that there are shocks that develop. But here we don't see any shocks developing. Right? So the experiment does, uh, does uh, confirm GHD. And we also looked at uh, double well to single well potential, Q'tum, quantum Newton cradle type of thing. And that also works pretty well, not as well, but there are a lot of uh, experimental in, um, imprecisions there, but it still works extremely well. So that seems to argue with experiments, the experimental check of the GHD equations themselves. There are other checks that we did, uh, maybe one or two minutes, um, numerical check for the correlation functions. So if you look at uh, the, the, correlation, the hydrodynamic projection formula that I told you about, well, you can check that in the Singe-Gordon model, the classical Singe-Gordon model. That's work with uh, Avise Bastianello, Gerard Watson, Takato Yishimura. So we look at classical uh, Singe-Gordon, simulated it by Monte Carlo sampling, and calculated correlation function of, se of certain observables for which we know eigenvalues. And we compare with GHD, with this kind of uh, hydrodynamic projection formula, and it works uh, pretty well, eh, quite well. And finally, just quickly, we also did the analysis of the cumulants that I told you about, of, the, of energy transfer, the full counting statistics. And there we took, this is work with uh, Jason Mayer, Joe Bassin, and Rosemary Harris. We took the simple classical hard rod gas, which is a gas of particles that hit each other and do nothing else. So they just go around basically and hit each other. So it's just a small uh, kind of modification of a free gas, but it's not free, and it has a description in terms of TBA. And we took our formula and did, again, Monte Carlo simulation and calculated the various cumulants, uh, C2, C3, C4. And again, it works very well. So the red line um, is the theory, and the blue uh, dots, which have a certain error bar, uh, is the Monte Carlo simulation. And that worked also extremely well. So all these uh, G G G uh, you know, formulas seem to work quite well. Okay, so I finished there. So uh, GHG seems to work uh, very well, but uh, it presents slightly different physics, although it's based on the same principle as ordinary hydro. It has slightly different physics. To be done are so many other things. I wanted to finish with this idea that thermalization is there, early hydro is there, diffusive hydro is there. We kind of understand all that. Can we go further? Can we do the full uh, derivative expansion? Does it have meaning? In fact, in, in GHG, the fundamental variable is this density in phase space, which is density of, of beta roots, or kind of a synthetic state. But uh, as we go to diffusive, its scale is no longer density of beta root. It's just some objects that you use. And if you go all the way to Boltzmann, does it become the density of actual particle in phase space? Can we actually go all the way from there to there, where this else, you know, changes its meeting, meaning and then becomes really Boltzmann kind of phase space density? That's the question. Thank you for your attention. Questions? So at some point you mentioned that uh, 